All right, let's turn our King James Bibles to uh, Frank. You can get seated. You can get seated for a little bit. I'm going to kind of work my way through this passage here a little bit. We'll uh, we'll go through it though. Genesis chapter one. I'm not going to do much preaching at you tonight. I'm going to assume that everybody's in good fellowship with the Lord Jesus. I'm going to assume that everybody's full of the Holy Ghost this uh, this evening because you're you're gonna you're gonna need to be to understand tonight's uh, study. There's going to be a lot of scripture. There's going to be one of those lessons where you just try to grab whatever you can. Some may go over your head, but you just try to grab whatever you can. I just recommend taking notes, listen closely, have a Bible in the hand, do a lot of flipping and turning with me. I hope you had a, your, you know, some coffee or a glass of iced tea or something like that to, to keep you up a little bit because uh, you're, you're going to need it. This is, gonna, this is a topic that I've believed for a while and I've, I've never taught on it. And I had to go back over some old notes and reread the scriptures again and find some new scriptures to this thing too and I uh, saw some things I never did before and it's always a blessing to re-examine something that you've been taught and see you know why why do I believe this you know well, what's the what's the deal with this thing here and um, so I'm, I'm excited to, to teach this and I hope that uh, I hope by the end of this that you know not only is your brain going to be like mush but uh, you can at least walk out of here you know in awe of our God and in awe of his of his word so we're going to start out in Genesis chapter 1 verse number 1 in the beginning, we're going to read the verse. We're going to read down to verse number twenty-nine, and and uh, and then we'll get into some things. So Genesis chapter one, I'll do a little bit of uh, exposition on each verse, kind of as we go a little bit. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, the very first sentence of the Bible. It's jam-packed with things. Uh, it's uh, the wording. It's it's so concise, and yet it's it's so precise. Uh, a few things about this this verse here. Um, if you're familiar with Bible numerics and things, it's the, the first verse in the Bible and the last verse in the Bible, they both have 44 letters, 27 consonants, 17 vowels. They're an exact match. And only, only in the King James Bible, of course, and do, do you understand who was behind you know, every single letter and word in that King James Bible? Who was behind it? Well, it was, it was God. As a matter of fact, let's, just find, let's, let's find the answer to that question uh, let's do it the hard way first. If you count every seven letters in that verse, I N, okay, that's one, two, the, two, three, four, five, six is B, seven's E, right after the seventh letter is G. Okay, and you count seven more letters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The letter after the seventh is O. Count the, the starting at the D, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or wait. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The eighth letter is D. You have G O D, you know, right after seven G seven O seven D. So God's behind it, and he God he's all he's all over the first sentence. Okay, he's all over it. You know, I don't believe that the King James translators were sitting around thinking, oh, what you know, what words and what letters can we use to have such a pattern? There's no way in the world. That's 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 God's fingerprint behind the text there. So what else do we have here? We have what's called a, uh, the, the time-space continuum. We have in the beginning, that's a, that's a frame of time. God, okay, there's your source. Cr uh, created, there's your energy. Heaven, that would be the space. And the earth, that would be your matter. So you have time, space, time, space, and matter. Times consisting of past, present, future. Which, which one of those components are more important than the other? None of them. They're all co-equal. Past, past, present, future. You can't have one without the other. Then you got space, length, width, and height. Which one of those is more important? None of them. All co-equal. Then you got matter, solid, solid, liquid, gas. And then you got, you know, the you got the Father, the Holy Ghost. The you know, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Which one of them is more important? None of them. They're all they're all co-equal and co-eternal. Whereas these things in here, time, space, and matter, they're not eternal. So that doesn't that's obviously makes them not God. Um, everything in creation is a manifestation of the Godhead, down to the very basic building block of of matter, which is an atom. Proton, neutron, electron, you're probably all familiar with all that. That's an atom. So time, space, matter. Now all this stuff, time is it's it's contained in a closed system. It has to be contained in a closed system. The the universe is not just some open thing. Time's contained in a closed system, and something has to put time into effect. What's that? That's the matter, okay? 
and uh, well, you know, if you didn't have matter, then time wouldn't be into effect, and you know, the, you have to. And we're going to see another thing. You're going to actually need the sun and the moon to put time into effect. But uh, another little interesting thing is, you, you know, why they call it the the universe out there. You know, that's a secular term, but they call it the universe, and it's just so happened to be uni means one in verse. That's what we call a verse in the Bible. So one verse. That's what the universe means, at least in my etymology. So, and that's true. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. So this 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 verse uh, gives you the source of creation. It wasn't a big bang, although God did. Sp- so he did speak the world into existence, and I'm sure his voice did thunder, you know, uh, as he spoke it into existence. You can read uh, Hebrews 11, uh, 3, when, you know, by faith we understand that the, that the world was, uh, was framed by the word, or the word of God and things. So he spoke and it was so. So notice this sentence here. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, period. It's a complete sentence. Period. All right. Now we're just gonna we're gonna continue reading on here and just uh, kind of go through uh, this this passage here. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, "Let there be light." And there was light. God saw the light that it was good, and divided the light from darkness. Called the light day, and the darkness called he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. God said, "Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters." And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under uh, the heaven be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and called uh, in gathering together of the waters, called he seas, and God saw it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and fruit tree, yielding its fruit after his kind, whose seed was in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed, and the tree uh, yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. God said, let there be lights and a firmament of the heaven, to divide the day and the night. For them, uh, Let them be for signs, for seasons, for days, for years, and let them be in the lights and the firmament of the heaven, to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to roll the day, the lesser light to roll the night. He made the stars also. He set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth, to roll over the day and over the night, and, he, and to divide the light and, uh, and the darkness. So you got uh, uh, third day, okay, plant life on the third day. He made the sun on the fourth day. You know, it's kind of like you need like a little darkness of germination, and he turned on the lights, and that kind of, you know, gets things kind of springing up a little bit. Uh, Let's see, the four, evening, morning, with the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly in moving the moving creature that hath life. So there you go, your first life coming about from water. Not primordial soup, but water. And, the, and fowl that fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So you got the waters, you got the fowl, you got uh, flying into heaven. God created great, now look, God created Great whales. Now, notice that word created has not been found in this chapter since verse number 1. Created. So from verse 1 to 21, you have God forming and God making. But this is the first mention so far, second mention, of actually uh, creating. Okay, and we're going to get into the definition of that later on. But that's interesting. God created great whales. And every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, God saw that it was good. Bless them, said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas. All right, fill it. And let the fowl multiply in the earth. In the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle, creeping thing, beast, after the earth, after his kind, it was so. God made the beast of the earth after his kind. Cattle, their kind, creeping thing, their kind, God saw it was good. And God said, okay, let us, God, one God said, let us, plural, that's the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Let us make man, singular, in our, plural, image. After our likeliness. We know that God is composed of a body, soul, and spirit. Okay, that's, that's the doctrine of the Godhead. And let them have dominion, I'd underline dominion, over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over all the earth. Let them have dominion over all the earth. Who? Man. And over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful, 
multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So the title of the, the message we want to talk about tonight is what happened between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. All right. Uh, let me just pray here again real quick. Dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, I just pray that you help me uh, teach these uh, these truths. Lord, I uh, found in your word. I pray that you give us open eyes to the things that we undertake here. I just pray, Lord, that I uh, just help me and just just uh, just help the hearts of the hearers, Lord, and, and those that are listening. And uh, just allow us to have a good, just a blessed Bible study tonight, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm going to read you something that I found off the web that I thought was pretty good. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and he was, he was then faced with a class action lawsuit for failing to file an environmental impact statement from HEPA, Heavenly Environmental Protection Agency, an angelically staffed agency dedicated to keeping the universe pollution-free. God was granted a temporary permit for the heavenly portion of the project, but was issued a cease and desist order on the earthly portion of the project, pending further investigation by, each, uh, by HEPA. Upon completion of his construction permit, the environmental impact statement, God appeared before HEPA Council to answer some questions. When asked why he began the project in the first place, he simply replied that he liked to be creative. This was not considered an adequate reason, and he was required to substantiate this further. HEPA was unable to uh, see any practical use for earth anyway, since the earth was void and empty, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And then God said, let there be light. He should have never brought that up at this point, since one member of the council was active in the Siri Angel Club and immediately protested, asking how the light was to be made. Would there be strip mining, air pollution? God explained that the light would come from a huge ball of fire. Nobody on the council really understood this, but, was provisionally, uh, but it was provisionally accepted, assuming, one, that there would be no smog or smoke resulting from the burning, two, a separate burning permit would be required, and three, since continuous light would be a waste of energy, it should be dark half the time, so God agreed to divide the light in the darkness, and he would call the light day in the darkness night. The council expressed no interest in in-house semantics. When asked how the earth would be covered, God said, let there be a firmament made in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. One ecological radical council member accused him of double talk, but the council table action since, uh, tabled action since God would have to first file for a permit from the ABLM, Angelic Bureau of Land Management, and further would be required to obtain water permits from the appropriate agencies involved. The council asked if there would, uh, if there would only be water in, in firmament, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed, uh, and the fruit tree after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. The council agreed as long as native seed would be used. About further development, God said, also said, Let the waters bring forth the creeping things having life, and the fowl that may fly over the earth. Here again, the council took no formal action, since this would require approval of the Fish and Game Commission, coordinated with the Heavenly Wildlife Federation. It then appeared that everything was in order, until God stated that he wanted to complete the project in six days. At this time, he was advised by the council that his timing was completely out of question, HEPA would require a minimum of 180 days to review the application, an environmental impact statement, and then there would be public hearings. It would take 10 to 12 months before a permit would be granted. It was at this time God was so fed up that he created hell. <laughs> That's just a funny little, funny little thing. Anybody that you know, anybody knows how to build and stuff like that, it's crazy about how crazy the borough can be in permits, environmental protection agency. Just amen, God didn't have to consult with anybody before he, he created things. Now, we have a Bible study tonight, all right? And it, this isn't something to fight about. This isn't something to split churches about. But it's, it's a subject of debate of, of what's been commonly termed as the gap theory, okay? The gap theory. And after further study, I don't see no theory to it. I believe it should be called the gap fact, not theory. And uh, this gap of time occurs between Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Now, it's not unreasonable to consider, the, you know, after the fact that in many many, many times in the Bible that God will speak in one verse about the sufferings of Christ and then in, in the verse right after that, he'll speak about the glory of Christ, his second coming. Um, most of us are familiar with Isaiah chapter 61. If you want to turn there, you can. Isaiah chapter 61. Uh, just, uh, just a thing on rightly dividing. Isaiah chapter 61, verse number 1. The Spirit of the Lord anointed me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath bound me up to uh, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives. 
in the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then remember what the Lord did when he read that in the temple. He closed the book. Okay, but the verse actually goes on. And the day of vengeance of our God. So remember he said, you know, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he shuts the book and he says, today this scripture was fulfilled before you. Okay. Well, that comma actually separates 2,000 years. That's quite, the, then it says the day of vengeance upon our God. That's the second coming. First coming, second coming in one verse, 2,000 years separated with a comma. All right, here, let's go to a more familiar one. Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6. How about this one? Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. A lot of that can be applied to the first coming. Okay, period. Then verse 7, Of the increase of his government, in peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice, from henceforth forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. I like that. The Lord's so zealous to perform that at the second coming. It, it, you know, it's like it, he's doing it by his strength and his power, but he's, he's zealous to perform that, and he will. But that, you know, first sentence right there, first coming. Second sentence below, second coming. So, the, you know, you've got a comma separating time, and it, it's, good, it's many times. You read the book of Daniel and all the prophetical books and, and the prophets and all that. Many times, one verse is talking about the tribulation. The next verse is talking about the millennium. The next verse is maybe church age application. Then it goes back up to the tribulation. Then it's millennium. Uh, you know, it kind of jumbles around. Then the next verse is talking about the new earth. You know, and, and uh, so you, if you ever read, read your Bible before, you'll see that the scriptures jump from place to place and time to time with no explanation other than you're told to search the scriptures and you're told to study to show that self approved unto God, a workman need not to be ashamed. You're told to rightly divide the, the word of truth. You want to hit them blinds over there, Phil? Put them. Yeah, call, yeah. somebody call Jordan, actually. I'm going to put them up on the pulpit. Let's shut them blinds. Everybody's going get, to get blinded here for a minute. So, you know, that's kind of tricky. You know, that's kind of tricky of the, of the Holy Spirit to, to do that, to kind of jumble up around like that. But that God wants you to study. He wants you to rightly divide the word of truth. So it's not, it's not far out to suppose that God would leap from one time period to another time period without making mention of it uh, right there, but he would make mention of it elsewhere in the scripture. So to make you search for it. And that's, you know, you, you're kind of reading between the lines a little bit here. So go back to Genesis here. Notice that, uh, notice that after Genesis 1.1, that's a complete sentence. All right, period. And then all the ands follow. And uh, verse 2 shows something negative that happened that caused God to, what I believe, recreate the earth. You see, you see the period there, and, uh, and, and you know, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There's nothing but darkness, and there's nothing but waters. So that's, that's, that's actually negative. There's a, something, something happened here, okay? And now, the, there's, an, there's arguments made by Christians who kind of dabble into science and from scientists who dabble into the Scriptures. You know, one hand, it's argued, uh, you know, there's scientific proof that the, that the earth is millions and billions uh, years old. And then, you know, and you, you dumb Christians think that, that this earth's only 6,000 years old. Uh, so, the, so you see the Bible can't be true because it doesn't match science, is what the scientists say. And then the, or the Christian takes the Bible and says, well, you dumb scientist, I don't care about the reality of what science tells me. Uh, you know, the, the, all, we, all we can account for is 6,000 years of man's existence on earth. And, uh, you know, and, and therefore, we're going to reject everything that you have to say when I'm going to listen to you. So the scientists laugh at the Christians, and the Christians are laughing at the scientists, and both of them blind themselves to all the truth, okay? Now, there's no contradiction in the Bible with a 6,000-year history of mankind, uh, of, Adam's, of Adam's descendants, and of very, very, very old universe. In earth, there's no, I don't believe there's no contradiction. 
in that. Now, did you notice in Genesis 1, 28, well, remember how, you know, when we, when we, what we just read, how he said, he told these, these you know, the, these, um, bat, the, the creeping things after their kind, what did he say? Re, uh, he said to fill, verse 22, God blessed them, said, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters. You, you fill it. You, did you call him, son? All right. To fill it. But, okay, so then you look over to Genesis 1, 28, God bless them, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish. If he wanted to say fill, he would have put fill there. God was completely capable of putting that word there if it was actually fill. Fill my glass of water. Okay, I'll fill it up. Now, you know, refill it or replenish the water that, you, that was once in there from the beginning. So he tells Adam to replenish the earth. Now, come to, uh, now that's significant, okay, for, for a reason here. Look at Genesis chapter 9, verse number 1. Genesis 9, 1. Genesis chapter 9, verse number 1. God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So had there been civilization before Noah and his sons? Yes, there has been. Okay, that's why God told him to replenish the earth. Populate again what was once populated before. Same words God spake to Adam. Now, I'm going to give you just a couple similarities between Adam and Noah. And you got to listen. These are, these are pretty interesting. So Adam, he had three sons, Seth, Cain, and Abel. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth. One of Noah's sons sins, Ham, and Noah wakes up and puts a curse on, on his boy Canaan. And uh, one of Adam's boys sins, Cain, and God actually curses him okay he curses he curses Cain and puts Cain under curse one of one of Adam's boys is a type of of Christ that would be Abel keeping his flock and stuff and uh, one of Noah's sons is a type of Christ that would be Shem blessed be the Lord God of Shem a Shemite you know that's where the Jews come from and all that when Adam sinned he was naked when Noah sinned he was naked he drank and got naked uh, bo both both sinned by taking something orally. Adam, he partook of the uh, forbidden fruit, which was a grape. I believe it was a grape. Noah took something orally, which was the fruit of the vine, which was wine. Uh, the Lord told Adam, be fruitful, multiply. He told Noah, be fruitful, multiply. He told Adam to replenish the earth. He told Noah to replenish the earth. Before God told Noah to replenish the earth, there was a catastrophic flood that destroyed everything. So, that stands to reason, before God told Adam to replenish the earth, there was a catastrophic flood that destroyed everything, which we find in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 2. So, go to 2 Peter chapter 3 now. 2 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse number 1. 2 Peter 3, verse number 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds in way of remembrance, that you be mindful of the words which are spoken before the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that, in the, that uh, there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. That would be Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. So last day, scoffers are going to say something like, you know, Jesus is never going to come again. And, you know, and all, and all those terrible judgments that you Christians talk about, that's not, that's not going to happen. Ever since the beginning of time, they've been saying things like that. And God's not going to, God, God's not, he never done anything like that. He never destroyed the world or nothing like that. And, you know, well, are you sure about that? He, he did. He did. You say, well, you know, when did he, uh, when did he, what is he talking about here? Well, look at verse number five. For this... The scoffers, they are willingly, they willingly are ignorant of. It's, it's willful ignorance. Willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. The world that then was. Okay, but the heavens and the earth, uh, which are now, 
by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of, of uh, ungodly men. So he said, okay, in, in, in verses 4 to 7, he said, you know, men are going to say all things continue as they were from the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And they do not fear God's destructive judgments upon the earth because such things uh, never happened. That's what, they, that's what they're going to say. But they're willingly ignorant that God did bring uh, destructive judgments upon the earth. And you say, okay, well, this could be, you know, we're talking about, you know, Noah's flood or, or anything or something like that. But no, it says the heavens were of old, the earth, standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world then was overflowed with water. The heavens were never completely flooded. We know the atmosphere is the first heaven, but outer space, when was outer, when was outer space flooded? <laughs> So there's a, there's, a, there's a time where the heavens were flooded. You know, the, the, the waters in Noah's days, it did not flood the heavens. It got up to the highest mountain. It might have reached the, uh, the stratosphere or something like that. But it did not go all the way past the atmosphere, out into outer space. No, it did not. Uh, it, it, it was, it, they flooded the earth. So 2 Peter 3 is a flood that drowned the heavens and the earth. And this was kind of like a... It, it was kind of like a prefigure of, of a future judgment in fire. Because, you know, then he says, Beloved, be not ignorant. <coughs> um, they, here, go to verse number 10. The ele, uh, look, in, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth, also the works that are therein, shall be burned. Seeing then that all these things are dissolved, you know, nevertheless we look for new heavens. That's a new atmosphere. That's a new outer space. We look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So he's talking about something that destroyed the heavens with the, the earth that then was, completely wiped that thing out, restarted. And it's kind of saying, well, yeah, he's going to do the same thing that he did in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. He's going to do it again, except it's going to be up by fire. Every element's going to be dissolved. So... Uh, yeah, verses verses ten to thirteen. So something happened. There was a there was a judgment of the heavens and the earth in Genesis one one, and uh, and he, it's interesting how Peter says if you know if you scoff at that then you're you're willingly ignorant of a of a Bible truth. All things do not continue as they were from from the beginning of, of creation. Something happened. So in Genesis chapter one, we see you know Adam was Adam was formed just as God wanted him to be formed, exactly how he wanted him to be. Adam fell into sin, and what happened? He needed to be restored again. Then Paul says in Romans chapter 7, Paul says, I was alive once, you know, and then sin came, and, and I died. I needed to be born again. Same with every one of us. We needed to be uh, born again. You had to be remade, so to say. Okay, now come to, come to uh, Isaiah chapter 45 here, another interesting verse. Isaiah chapter 45, verse number 18 Something happened to, this, to the, the world that then was. And we don't got time to, to look at the, the, three, the three worlds. It talks about the old, the old world was Noah's world. Well, the old world, it says in that passage, that was Noah's world. The world that then was, that's Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Then, nevertheless, we look for new heavens and new earths. You find three worlds in that passage there. So look at Isaiah chapter 45, verse number 18. Isaiah 45, verse number 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. So did God create, you know, the earth vain, and like empty for no, empty, void, you know, formless for, for no reason? No, he created it to be inhabited. And like I said, Genesis 1, 1, that's a complete statement, okay? If he, God created the heaven and the earth. In that verse, he didn't, it's not, okay, I'm just going to make this heaven and earth and it's just going to float out there for millions of years. No, he, he made that even to be inhabited. So the question comes up, well, who, who was inhabiting the, the earth that, that then was? Just as, as Adam, he was made to be a dwelling place of God. Made to be, you know, uh, you know, but he fell, he needed to be restored. Just as we were made to be the dwelling place of God, but we fell, we needed to be restored so that, you know, now we're the temple of God, God dwells inside of us. So the earth uh, was made to be a dwelling place of God. 
it, with his people, with his creation, all living together, all in harmony and things. But some, something brought destruction that it had to be restored. Just like man, just like me, just like, you know, just, just, just like the creation. So do you know what that would mean if we think about this? It would mean that you can find remnants of continents and remnants of cities underneath of the very bottom of the oceans today. Scientists would tell you they only explored 95% of, of the oceans, and I don't doubt for a second that the city of Atlantis is somewhere down in, uh, in the ocean. I don't doubt that. I, don't know. I believe the Bible could uh, 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 signify the, the, those types of things, or whatever those cities, it might not have been called Atlantis, but whatever those cities were called, you might find civilizations, you know, uh, remnants of a civilization on top of mountains, in the, the Andes Mountains over in, in Peru. You, they might, you know, find some civilization up there, or it could mean that the pyramids that were built over there in Egypt, I don't know, they were, maybe they were built by, you know, the, the, even science, they don't know how they built these things. They don't know how this thing was, uh, we don't even have the technology today, supposedly, to build something, you know, like they did back, back in the day. That's a smart civilization when you think of it, and everything's lined up with the stars and certain compartments in the pyramid. You look in this one hole and it goes right to this star. I mean, you know, that's pretty wild, pretty far out things there. Um, and it, it might mean that you might be able to find fossils of creatures that, that lived, you know, on the land and in the sea that you can't find anymore. Well, why? Because it says in Genesis 1 that God created different things. To, he created whales in, in fowls of the air. Thing, you know, he didn't, he didn't make pterodactyls in Genesis chapter 1 or, or uh, you know, what else, another one, Brachiosaurus or whatever, Triceratops or whatever. He made different animals. I don't know. Maybe they, maybe they did exist back in Genesis 1. I'll give you one verse on that later on in the study. I'll give you my, I guess maybe my interpretation on that, but well, I'll leave it up for you. You could see what, uh, what you think about it. So the question is, what brought about this problem in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2? When God does something, He does it, it's supposed to be inhabited. We see, we, we see darkness show up in Genesis 1, 2. God is light in him is no darkness. Where did darkness come from? We see waters that just, it just submerse everything. The earth standing in the water and out of the water. The heavens perished. I mean, this is a, this is a mass amount of water. The thing was all flooded and he divided everything. He put the waters up here, which would be the sea of glass. Put the waters down here at the base of the universe. Got the earth. He, he hangs the earth upon nothing. So there is what is obviously water in the universe. We covered that before. But what caused... This, this judgment of Genesis chapter 1, verse number 2. The earth was without form and void. Darkness upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Well, come to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah 14. All right, we're going to see, we're going to see what happened here. Isaiah chapter 14, look at verse number 12. All right, Isaiah 14, 12. It says this. How art thou fallen from heaven... O Lucifer. All right, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Lucifer, do you know who that is? That's the light bearer. That's what his name means. Okay, Satan before the fall. And to, to this day, we, Paul talks about Satan could transform himself into an angel of light. Lucifer meaning the light bearer. That's, and uh, I believe this passage is talking about the fall of Lucifer. Now, when did that happen? When did this happen? It happened in time past. Look what it says. How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Okay, weaken the nations. Now, there may be a double application here, uh, you know, there, of his past. What happened in his past, it might happen again in the tribulation. But if, if this is, let's say this is future application, then to this day, his name is still Lucifer, if it's future application. But let's say that this is talking about his past, uh, his past, what happened in his past, he, cut, he was cut down to the ground. He did weaken the nations. So what, what nations? What's going on here? What nations was he weakening? Look at the next verse, verse number 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, that's where all the trouble starts, I will ascend into heaven. Okay, I will, that's, that's, probably the, that's probably the atmosphere. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Now he wants to get in the second heaven. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, third heaven. I will ascend, then he says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's probably about as far as he got when you actually think of this. Sin was in his heart. He took action, 
and said, I'm going to burst off, you know, watch me. I'm going to fly up and I'm going to shoot off right now. I got all the technology, whatever I'm going to do, I'm, I'm shooting off. And this is when the Lord, I believe the Lord said in, in Luke, he said, I beheld Satan fall. Uh, what do you say? Uh, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Which heaven? I mean, I don't know. He might have just got above the clouds thinking I'm going to get to the stars. And the Lord dropped him down so quick, quick as lightning. You ever see lightning strike? I mean, that had to be absolutely humiliating. Like, watch me, guys. I'm going to get ready. I'm going to shoot up there. And God dropped him flat on his back like lightning. <laughs> That's crazy to me. This, that, this had to be quite the, the scene here when I'm, when I'm thinking about this. And uh, God knocked him down, all right? And for, so for Satan to ascend into heaven... Do you know, you know what he had to do? He had to go above some clouds. So it tells you there's clouds. Okay, and uh, you know, he had to go past stars. And okay, maybe them stars were other types of angels. You know, the morning stars sang together before the earth was created. So we know actually before Genesis 1-1, some other things happened. The sons of God shouted for joy when they, when they literally seen God speak something into existence. That had to be a pretty joyous time. That's, that's, you know, that's pretty amazing to think of that. That shows up before Genesis 1-1. So he had to get past the stars. You, you remember our study in 2 Corinthians 12. Paul got caught up to the third heaven, three heavens, atmosphere, outer space, eternity, which is God's domain. So ascend above the clouds, that's first heaven, above the stars, second heaven. I will sit also upon the mountain of the congregation, in the sides of the north. Like he wanted to be at the right hand of God. Who's, who's at the right hand of God? The Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't say, I'm going to kick God off the throne. I'm going to sit in his throne. <laughs> he ain't that stupid, you know, but I'm going to sit right next to him. I'm going to be right there with him. I'm going to sit, you know, I will sit also upon the mountain congregation in the sides of the north. That's God's domain, the third heaven. So if Lucifer had to get past the, cl the clouds, he had to get past the stars to get where God's throne is, do you know where he had to be at this point of time? He had to be on earth. It's the only place he had to be. Now, uh, where, where was Lucifer when he rebelled against God? He was on the earth. Uh, how many of you thought that Lucifer rebelled in heaven? I was taught that as a kid. I've always heard that. I don't know where I heard it. I just was heard there was a big rebellion. There was a big fight up. They probably pulled out from Revelation 12. You know, there was a war in heaven. And in my mind, I always thought, man, you know, what happened in heaven? Could, could you imagine in God's throne room, a fight breaking out, and could you imagine a guy coming in and there's sin in his heart in actual God's throne room? <laughs> Come on, you, God, I can't see God allowing such a thing like that. Iniquity started down on this planet. I heard a preacher once say, you know, iniquity started up, up in heaven and it came down. It, it kind of sounded good at first, but then I was thinking, wait a minute, sin in heaven? What would I want to go there for if there's a chance that God would allow the chance for sin to be in heaven. No, it, it, Lucifer was on earth, okay? And he thought to ascend into heaven. All right, look at verse number 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee, uh, they that see thee shall look narrowly upon thee and consider thee, saying, is this the man? All right, underline that, the man. Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? All right, underline tremble. Don't forget those words, okay? So notice Lucifer here is referred to as a man. Now, this is where it's, you know, you kind of make a, maybe a double application. Yeah, it's the man of sin. It's the son of perdition. This might be what he's going to be trying doing in the tribulation period. Possibly, but, you know, the, I believe this is, this is clearly speaking of the, the fall of, of Lucifer. What's up, Jordan? We're going to keep you on, on silent here, all right? Or put yourself on silent. Never mind. <laughs> Here. Um, yeah, underline man, underline tremble. He's referred to as a man. All right, Jordan, you hear me? Yeah, I can hear what's going on, B. All right, what's going on, brother? So here, look, put your phone on, uh, on silent here. We're in Isaiah chapter 14, all right? 14. Isaiah 14. We're just going through some, some things about, about Lucifer's fall. We're, we're talking about the gap of Genesis 1-1 one, one and Genesis 1-2, all right? All right, so now... Once again, is this the man that made the earth to tremble? So, man. Now, there's many times in the Bible where angels are also called men. Um, Genesis chapter 18, verse 2. Genesis 19, verse 1. You know, bringing these men out that we may know them. You know, familiar with that story with, you know, Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? 
that did shake kingdoms, okay, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of his prisoners, okay? So most of you read the book of Revelation, and, you know, you know, haven't you read in Re Revelation, you know, about destructions of, of cities and, you you know, you're, but what, what you're actually reading in Revelation is Satan really isn't doing that. It's, it's God that's really doing that destruction. It's the wrath of the Lord. It's the day of the Lord's vengeance. Yes, he's using the powers of darkness and he's using the devil, but it's, it's God. He's fulfilling his determination. He's fulfilling his determination to gather kingdoms to pour upon his wrath. We, we, we know about that stuff. Using, using the power of darkness. But Isaiah 14, I believe it's speaking of a, a, a day in, in times past uh, where Lucifer rebelled and he became at that moment Satan. Uh, I, don't know, I still don't know. Satan. Okay, Satan. Which, what's that word mean? It means adversary. That's what, that's what it means. He's, so he, he became the adversary of God. So in Isaiah 14, we see Lucifer, he's destroying kingdoms. And Lucifer brought out wreck and ruin and caused God to, to judge the earth. Now come to Job. Come to the book of Job. Come to Job. So if, that, if that's, you know, in, in time past, it tells you that there's kingdoms, tells you the, 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 the uh, cities and prisoners and some things going on, all right? Look at, look, at, look at Job chapter 22. Job chapter 22. Verse number 8, okay, Job 22, and I want you to notice the wording very carefully. Look at Job 22, verse number uh, 8. But as for the mighty man, underline mighty man, he had the earth, and the honorable man dwelt in it. Two men here. One, one had, past tense, the earth, and it was, it was his at one time. He had it. The honorable, the honorable man, definite article, the honorable man, one man, who was a man of honor, dwelt in that earth that the mighty man once, once had. Now, there's, there's only one point in history where that verse will fit. There's only one point in history where there's ever been one man on earth who had been honorable, and that man was dealing with, with a mighty man who once had the uh, possession of the earth where the honorable man is now living. Who could these characters be? They would be Adam and Satan in the garden. The mighty man would be the devil. The honorable man would be Adam. It's the only time that that, that, that would fit anywhere else if it's literally speaking of two men. One guy had the earth and there's, there's an honorable man in it. So this you start thinking, why do you think the devil went after Adam? God formed Adam, you know, the dust of the ground, you know, he's like a clay man, and like, right, like, just before, you know, the clay was even dried up, it was still wet, you know, the, the devil went right after Adam, like, quick, you know, we, we see Genesis chapter 3, he, he went to him pretty fast, why, okay, well, what's, the, what's, what happened here, because God says in Genesis 1, God says to Adam, you've been given dominion over the earth, subdue it, it's under you now, you have dominion over this whole earth here, okay? And the former possessor, the one who once had it, he wants it back. So what's he going to do? He's, he's going to, that's what this whole thing's been about since the Garden of Eden, is who, who gets control of this earth? And Adam, he, uh, he gave it to, to Satan, and, and, and Jesus Christ, he came back to, to reclaim it, and he's coming back very soon to take possession of it. You know, he, he kind of bought the title, he purchased it with his blood, but... He don't got it in possession right now yet. He bought it at the cross. He's coming back to really take possession of it. So the Bible still says today that Satan is the God of this world. That's, that's really quite the title. I still can't. I mean, that's a, that's a title. He's the, that's a, you know, it's like crazy to even imagine. You tell that to the average Christian, Satan's the God of this world. They're like, what are you talking about? You know, God's on, I know God's on a throne. He's, you know, he's rolling rain. But that's what the Bible says. So there got to be some some something to that okay so uh the that's the main theme of the bible is who's gonna run the world who's on the throne really look at look at job 22 verse number 10 therefore snares are round about thee and sudden fear troubleth thee or darkness that thou canst not see 
and abundance of waters cover thee. You know, they call Job, I believe they call him one of the poetic books. So a lot of the, your commentators are just going to say it's just a bunch of poetry and it's figurative and symbolism. And there, There's probably some things in here, okay? There's probably something to that. Uh, we, did we ever read about darkness with no lights at all? Yeah, Genesis 1-2, darkness upon the face of the deep. Did we ever read about, you know, uh, the abundance of waters covering thee? Yeah, we, we read about that in 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, uh, the destroying the, uh, the heavens, okay? Now, Job uh, verse 12, Is not God in the height of the heaven? That sounds like a little bit like Isaiah 14. He wants to get up, you know, where God's at. And behold, the height of the stars, how high they are. How high they are, okay? Um, I, once again, Isaiah 14. Look at verse 13. And thou sayest, how, how doth God know? Can he judge through the dark cloud? You know, there's something, something to that. Clouds are always interesting. You know, there's some supernatural clouds. The, the pillar of cloud by day and, you know, they talk about UFO talk and how that would be quite the camouflage of a ship. Instead of spray, spray, spray painting it black or whatever, get that thing to look like a cloud up there. That would be, be quite the camouflage. How does God know? Can he judge through the dark cloud? Your common sense would say, yeah, sure he can. He can just look right through it, you know. Verse 14, thick clouds are a covering to him that he seeth not, and he walketh in the circuit of heaven. So that's pretty interesting too. You know, what's in clouds, in, you know, even in heaven, the first heaven? What is inside of those things? Electricity, lightning, light. Okay, and uh, that's what lightning is. Gener now, generally, a circuit, here's a definition, can refer to a closed path along which electric current flows or a series of interconnected elements or locations visited in sequence. So when, when the Lord ascended up, I guarantee you, it's, that verse says, and he walketh in the circuit of heaven. That's his, that's his route. When he ascended up, he probably, he, he got the circuits down somehow. I don't know, he's walking along that circuit. And no doubt at the time of Lucifer, and when the sons of God ruled the world, but you believe the Lord Jesus Christ is walking down there with them. He's trying to fellowship with them, just like he was trying to fellowship with garden, Adam, and, Adam and Eve in the garden, walking and talking with them. And the devil probably saw the Lord Jesus Christ walking around this earth and ascending up. He, he's walking through the circuits in heaven, and the devil looked at that and was probably like, I want to do that. You know, I wish I could walk the circuits of heaven. Well, then Louis says in verse number 15, Hast thou marked the old way which wicked men have trodden, which were cut down out of time, whose foundation was overflown with a flood. That's interesting. Most people say, okay, it's just, that's, that's Noah's flood. Okay, that's what they would say. It's Noah's flood. Well, I'm going to tell you it's the flood of Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, actually. Say, okay, so you think of this. Wicked men have, have trodden a certain path, and they were cut down. Well, that's Isaiah 14. How art thou cut down, which did weaken the nations, as a direct reference to when people were actually cut down. No doubt it was the devil. No, there was no doubt people were, 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 were with him. Satan was cut down when he tried to get above the clouds, above the stars, where, where actually God was walking around. I believe he, God was walking in that circuit. He wanted to be like that and, and get up there. So Job 22 is, is kind of showing you like a, a, a civilization of 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 men, so to say, not like how we are. We're the only ones in the Bible for sure that are made in the image of God, body, soul, and spirit. All right, we lost Jordan. Body, soul, and spirit. No other, an angel isn't like that, cherubim, seraphim, nobody else is like that. But men could just be a reference to, so I'm not saying way before Adam there was men like we were. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but men as in the sons of God and things like that, okay? So come to verse number 16, which were cut down out of time. Now, how do we measure time? Well, the sun and the moon. How, how would we measure time if we didn't have a sun and the moon? <laughs> Think about that. We couldn't, actually. So, which God made after Genesis 1-1. So, there, there was no sun or moon in Genesis 1-1. So, really, time wasn't put into effect yet. They're, they didn't know what, what time was. They thought this was going to be it. This is eternal. It wasn't put in effect. So whoever these men were, they were cut down out of time. Like somebody was cut down before 
the sun and the moon showed up before time really kind of got rolling here, okay? So pretty wild stuff, okay? Now look at Job 22, 16, whose foundation was overflown with a flood. So the men who dwelt on the earth, okay, they dwelt on the earth when the mighty man had it, and uh, but before time they were cut down, overthrown with a flood. Now look at verse number 17. Which said unto God, depart from us. And what can the Almighty do for them? Ain't that an interesting question? And I, look, I believe the devil is saying something like, you know, Satan said, you don't need God. You don't need God. I can do everything for you that God can do. And I, I believe somewhere in there, yet he filled their houses with good things. But the counsel of the wicked men is far from me. You bow down to me, I'll give you anything you want. I'll fill your house with nice things. I'll give you health, wealth. You look at the big Hollywood stars. And they say, I sold my soul to the devil. What do you give me? Bunch of merchandise. Bunch of stuff, bunch of things. And, uh, you know, devil, devil's pretty much saying, he can't, God can't do anything that I can't do. Follow me. And some of them did. Some of the sons of God did do that. And what that resulted, and that resulted God flooding out the heavens uh, and the earth and bringing about destruct, uh, destruction to the world that then was, that Second Peter chapter 3 talks about. <clears throat> so when did this take place? Well, that's the whole point of the study. When did Satan's fall Lucifer's fall take place sometime after Genesis 1 1 sometime before Genesis 1 3 okay that'd be the only place that it that it fits people say this well Satan fell in the garden I don't believe in the gap they call it gap theory he fell in the garden well I don't you know think about this Satan he was the crooked serpent before he came to Eve wasn't he that's what he was he was Levi he was a crooked serpent before he came to Eve he was cursed again to go upon his belly so he's getting cursed throughout the whole Bible but uh, he was wicked before he came to Eve. That wasn't when he fell right along with Eve. No, no, okay? Now, um, come to Matthew. We'll look a little bit more. I'm going to give you something. In Matthew chapter 12, I'm going to show you something else about this, about this mighty man, okay? Matthew chapter 12. Okay, this mighty man who once had the earth. Now, you know what happened. The weaker, the weaker vessel took the fruit and ate it. Why, why did Satan go after Eve? The, you know, the, the Bible says you know, the woman is the weaker vessel. He, he knew if he can get to Eve, he can get to Adam. In Adam, I like what that verse says in Job, actually. It's pretty interesting. Adam was the honorable man. And uh, what's that? He was sinless. He was an honorable man. He, was not, he wasn't going to let his wife just run away with some guy, you know, some devil, and, and that's it. You know, to hell with her. Forget about her. God, I got 23 more other ribs you can take make me a new wife <laughs> you know he didn't he didn't even say that he was he was honorable and the devil knew if i can get his wife to do this she'll run back to him and she'll she'll give the because the bible says adam was not deceived but the woman was being deceived was in the transgression or something like that he knew exactly what he was getting into and being the honorable man that he was he he didn't say get out i'm divorcing you or get out of here i'm done with you he said man i got i got i'm gonna take it so I partook, so like he said, I partook of the fruit also, you know, and of course he, he felt guilt and remorse and man, what did I just do, you know, but, uh, you, you know, you just think he was not going to let his wife die. So that's obviously the beautiful picture, Adam and Eve, honorable man, his wife, you know, dying for his wife in a way, Christ, the honorable man, dying for us who were deceived, <laughs> You know, we were deceived. Well, he wasn't, you think Jesus was deceived? No. He knew exactly what he was doing. It's just like as Adam knew exactly what he was doing. So, uh, um, come to, uh, um, yeah, Matthew chapter 12. Okay, Matthew chapter 12, let me see. So, it's interesting how, you know, the, the, the crown, it's like, it's like Adam took the crown off his head and placed it on and kind of gave it back to the devil. Because, you know, you kind of think about that, God, uh, Adam had dominion over all the creeping things and stuff. If that was just some regular snake, God, Adam didn't have dominion over that thing. Something happened. He, he kind of willingly submitted and gave himself over in a way to the, to the devil. But thank God, you know, for God's grace, he provided a way to forgive him and all that stuff. So that's, that's good news too. And then the devil, remember this too though, he takes Jesus Christ up into the mountains. He shows him all the kingdoms of the earth in a moment of time. And he says, all, all these are mine, and I give them to whoever I want to give them to. And the, devil didn't, and, and the Lord didn't say, no, you're lying, because they were his, they were his to give. He, you know, that's, 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 uh, 
You know, God, God did give them to Adam, but then Adam forfeited them to the devil. And who's going to have to come back and get back on the throne again? The Lord Jesus Christ is going to have to take, take all that back. So look at, look at Matthew chapter 12, look at verse number 28, Matthew 12, 28. Okay, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house? That's kind of like a mighty man. Enter into the strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he... Christ, that would be Christ, first bind the strong man. Who would that be? Satan. And then he, Christ, will spoil his house. It's an interesting, interesting picture there. Okay, so suppose somebody showed up and, and, and you know, just walked into the house of a, of, a, of a strong man who can actually whip him. I got no chance of beating this strong man up. He's going to beat me to a pulp, okay? But what I got to do is I got to I got to I got to bind this man. I got to tie him up, so in order that I can get some things and spoil his house. That's what that's what that verse is saying. I'm gonna bind the strong man and take his goods. Well, look at uh look at Colossians chapter two here. Colossians chapter two, and that's 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 the picture of the Lord. And the strong man there is the devil. I guess the house would be is the world. In uh, the in all the souls that the devil kind of had and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, he will spoil his house. Now come to Colossians chapter two, interesting verse here. Colossians chapter two, verse number thirteen. In you being dead in your in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against him, which was contrary to him, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Having spoiled, there's that word again, spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So he went to the cross, paid for the penalty of sin, bought your soul with his blood, crown of thorns on his head, which would, would, would resemble, uh, resemble the curse, the, you know, curse would be the ground for thy sake, thorns and thistles shall bring forth. He was buried, he went down there, led captivity captive, uh, and kind of spoiled the strong man's house, so to say. Now, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, he got the keys to death and hell. He, uh, he, has all, he says, all power of, of uh, heaven and earth is, is given to me. And but what, what, here's another thing. The Lord got some more treasure that he has to come back for at a later date, which is obviously at the rapture. He's going to come back in and I don't know, put, push the devil out, out of the side and say, come up hither, spoil the goods once again at, at the rapture. So... He's come back and taking control. Now, come to Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4. All right, here's another very interesting one here. Jeremiah chapter 4. Now, the young earth creationists, okay, young earth creationists, like uh, Kent Hovind, he'd fall into it. And I, I used to watch Kent Hovind a lot, actually. I have him written down in one of my, you know, my journey to uh, Kent Hovind creationism. 5-4-2018, creationist. November 24, 2018, about the Evolutionary hand, Handbook. I was watching Perry Stone, 6, 8, 18, he's a charismatic, and then I got a whole Gene Kim, History of Bible Believers, 9, 24, 2018, first video I've ever, ever watched of him. Somehow, it's, it's good, to, good to have them dates, but young earth creationists, okay, they say that, you know, they found men in, in dinosaur footprints side by side, and they say, you know, See, that proves that dinosaurs lived 6,000 years ago. Okay, maybe, maybe it proves that men lived 2 billion years ago. And you say, wait a minute, that sounds like heresy. You know, the, the, your average, you know, we have, we, we, I'm not talking about men like me and you. I'm talking about sons of God, okay. Uh, all we know for sure is that the Bible says, it's, you could trace it back, it's been 6,000 years since Adam. 6,000 years from our father and our mother, Adam and Eve, but it says, the Bible says you're willingly ignorant of, of this, of, of some, uh, if, it, to say that nothing happened from the beginning of the creation. Genesis 1 1. God created heaven and the earth. You'd be willingly ignorant. Plenty has happened. All right, look at Jeremiah chapter 4, look at verse number 23. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. In the heavens, 
uh, in, the, uh, in, in the heavens, and they had no light. Now, the earth's low, was without form and void. Does that match anything that we ever read before? It, it's almost a perfect match of Genesis 1.1. If we're going to cross-reference in how we study our Bible, it's almost a perfect match. Compare Scripture with Scripture. Then, okay, uh, behold, the earth low was without form and void, the heavens, and they had no light. So that's obviously before Genesis 1-2, okay? Or that's, that would, that's probably, this is in the place of Genesis 1-2, darkness was upon the face of the deep, okay? Verse 24, look what happened now. I beheld the mountains, okay, mountains. So this tells you that the previous earth that Lucifer rolled on, it had mountains on it. L Lucifer wasn't rolling some, on some flat piece of paper, some black and white animated stupid video game or something. The thing obviously had mountains. It had terrain. I mean, that's, that's actually, you know, I can, it makes sense. Uh, then it says, look, so I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled. And all the hills, there's, okay, it tells you there's hills, moved lightly. All right, lo, the, and now remember, they trembled. Remember, is this not the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake the kingdoms? So what I'm presenting to you is that, that these kingdoms and these nations were way back before Adam. That's what I'm, that's what I'm giving you. You, you, you know, you can take it or leave it, okay? You can split the church up about it and say, oh, you're you know, wrong. But this, this, I, this is what I, I actually believe. Is. I see this in here. Uh, it's, it's, you could say it's you know, my interpretation. You, go, you could come down and read verse number, or you could read Dr. Ruckman's commentary and say, wait a minute, he's, call, he's calling you stupid for what you're saying up there. Well... So be it. I'll take a rebuke from Dr. Ruckman. This is one, one area in there that I, I don't agree with his footnote down here. And, you know, you say, well, you're, you know, some rebel, whatever. No. <laughs> Obviously not every th single thing in his Bible, in his re reference Bible, is, am I going to see eye to eye on? I don't see eye to eye with him on this, on this thing here. Go, go read it when you get home. Don't, don't ruin my teaching right now. <laughs> read it when you get home because then you'll shut me off. Now, all the hills move lightly. Okay, so there's a, there's a prehistoric earth terrain. Hills, mountains. Okay, now look. I beheld, and lo, there was no man. Okay, there was no man, and all the birds of the uh, and all the birds of the heaven fled. So there was no man. Now I, I have it in my notes. All the co all commentators. You could even look up uh, um, Matthew Henry. I believe is, is one of them. Um, I'm not sure about what Schofield says about it. If anybody got a Schofield note, he actually might put this in the gap, which I, I would tend to agree with. But most of your commentators, they would say that this, this is at the end of the great, this is talking about the great tribulation. But wait a minute. When at the end of the tribulation is there not a single man living on earth? There's men at the end of the tribulation, isn't there? There's the 144,000, there's the remnant, there's people that refuse the mark of the beast. So I take it as, this is speaking of something in Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 here going on. So I beheld there was no man. And all the birds of the heavens were fled, which is the opposite. At the end of the Great Tribulation, God says, come on, birds, let's go have a great supper. And I want you to eat these kings and feast, the feast on the bodies of these kings. So they, they come to the earth. But here, birds of the, of the, now look at this, underline this, birds of the heavens were fled. When's the last time you saw a crow flying around in outer space? <laughs> they don't fly that high. You know what I mean? That's so. There, there's something going on here, okay? All the birds of the heavens were fled. Now, these are some birds here. What can these be? Well, uh, birds that don't just fly in the atmosphere, they have the ability to fly higher than the trophosphere all the way into the exosphere. So there's your memory back in, back in school. You know, the trophosphere is 10 miles above. Then you get the stratosphere where the planes are going. You get the mesosphere, 32 to 85 miles up. Then you got the thermosphere, 86 to 372 miles up. Then the exosphere, okay, layers of the of the atmosphere. I don't know, on in God's mind, what what you know dictates the first heaven from the second heaven. But I'll take it as these birds. They're flying. They're flying higher than at least the troposphere, let's say at least they're flying 10 miles high. Or, I mean, they're flying, uh, you know, where airplanes fly. That's, that's quite the birds of, of heaven. So whatever kinds of birds they are, they're, I would say they're a pretty advanced civilization. I don't know. Now, these birds, these birds could be, I also go back and forth with this, these birds could be a reference to devils, 
Could be. Remember the sower and the seed? Remember that parable? The fowls came and devoured this. What's a fowl? A bird. The fowls came, devoured the seed. Uh, and what's the interpretation of the parable? And Jesus said, the fowls are devils. So there's, a, there's a, maybe a connection there. Revelation 18.2, Babylon is, fi- is filled with devils and, and every hateful bird. It's either, it's either God really hates crows and he really hates this particular vulture or turkey vulture, or he hates a hateful devil, an unclean spirit or whatever, okay? Um, you know, I don't think those are your everyday sparrows and robins that he's talking about, of that hateful bird. The Holy Ghost descended like a dove. So possibly that verse is a reference to maybe devils or something like that, or maybe it's some creatures that God judged. Maybe that could be your one of your pterodactyls. All right, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not too sure about that. But I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. Okay, that's that's pretty well. Now, verse number twenty-six. Keep going. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. Okay, the fruitful place was a wilderness. Now, remember. Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake the kingdoms that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof? We read in Isaiah. Well, there Jeremiah says, I behold, lo, the, it was once a fruitful place. So when Lucifer was rolling this, this, his, his world at one point in time, like it had mountains, it had all kinds of stuff. It was a fruitful place. Talk about a prehistoric earth with big trees and big greenery and big waterfalls and it was fruitful. That's, uh, I mean, that's how I can see it. Fruitful place. Um, all, now look at this now. And all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. So some serious judgment took place in, in, unto what, in, you know, where Jeremiah, or Jeremiah is talking about. So, so far in this, in this pre-Adamic world, the, 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 earth, the earth that then was where Lucifer was rolling, we have mountains, hills, birds, fruitful place, cities. Now look at verse number 27. For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. I don't think this is, not on this, I don't uh, fit in the comet and the big meteor come down and blacken out the sun and, you know, whatever like that or... Um, you know, wiped out the dinosaurs or something like that. No, no. If, if anything, it was a it was a global another flood that wiped out a lot of those things, if they ever existed. Okay. Jeremiah four twenty eight. Now look at this. For okay. Well, anyways, I'm, I'm going to make a comment on on verse twenty seven. For thus the Lord said, the whole land shall be desolate. Yet will I not make a full end. Now this is one of the most mysterious questions that everybody asks at one point of time in their life. I ask these questions. When I'm laying in bed and just thinking and stuff like that. And when Lucifer rebelled, why didn't God just destroy everything that he just made and completely start out from scratch? Just him back in God, eternity, light, clothed, nothing but white. Why didn't he say, forget about this, this has been a mess, I'm, I'm restarting over, I'm going to do everything again with no devil? That's a, that's a fair question. You know, it's a, you know, well, he had a purpose for what he made. The Lord had a purpose. That's the Bible answer. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 28. Look at, now look at this now. I always think this is interesting. For this, for this thing, what, what we just read about, the birds heaven fled, the fruit place turned, the, the, the cities were broken down in the, par- in the presence of the Lord and all this. For this shall the earth mourn. When you go to a funeral, what do you put on? You put on black. It's a sense of mourning. The earth, okay, the earth... Lucifer's rebellion literally caused the earth to mourn. Uh, it, it mourned back then. And Paul says, you know what? It, it's interesting. It mourned back then. And Paul says in his, one of his writings, the whole creation uh, travaileth and, and, and groaneth. Remember that in Romans chapter 8? Until the manifestation of Jesus Christ comes back and he you know, fixes everything. The whole creation is groaning. It's, 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 it's groaning now, but it mourned. Way back in the day, in Genesis 1. So now look at this, now look at this part. For this cause the, the earth shall mourn, the heavens above be black. Because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, I will neither repent, neither turn back from it. 
the heavens above be black. That's Genesis 1-2. Darkness. So God is light, in him is no darkness. Darkness shows up as a result of some fall that took place, some dark spiritual darkness that took place. Every time we see the night sky, every time we look up in, into outer space and it's black as can be, that's just a reminder we're living in a sin-cursed world. He, that's the whole, in a way, the whole reason why the outer space, space, black as can be with little specks of light scattered throughout. You know, I mean, if this is how God really wanted, everything would be just blank. You know, God's, you know, that's why in the new heaven, new earth, there's no more sun. I don't even know if there's a moon there. The, the, the light of the lamb lights up everything. But that's not, today. that's not today. We have a black sky. Heavens above be black as a result of Lucifer's fall. I have purposed it. I will not repent. Neither will I turn back from it. So when God spake this thing into existence, okay, he wasn't, he wasn't going to clear the slate like one of these dry erase boards and I'm going to just erase everything, forget about the devil, I'm going to draw me a new thing, and, and you know, we'll get going from there. It's not how he works, okay? He, he used what he created and did not repent from the purpose why he created it. What did he create it for? Fellowship and worship. For, to, for, to, to please him, for his pleasure. Uh, and, you know, in this kind of, and you know, I think about this, this gets into that one phrase, in Revelation 13, 8, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. What? The lamb slain from the foundation of the world? You know, meaning, you know, God's eternal plan, okay? The sacrificial plan of, of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ was foreseen. It was predetermined even before the world was created. God knew if this would happen, you know, the, he knew the probabilities of everything and he knew what he was going to do afterward and he purposed it. If this certain thing, I'm not going to change my mind from it. I'm going to do it this way. This starts boggling me up. I can't, you know, I can't really go much farther than that. Okay. But the Lord, he did count the cost of all the probable outcomes before he spake things into existence. And he knew at the end of the day, it would cost me my life at the end of the day, Went way back and back then. Now, because I've spoken it, I've purposed it, I will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. So in Genesis 1-3, God says, all right, let's kind of do this thing again. He made, we read in that verse, we, he made, he separated, he divided, he formed, but he didn't create until he got to the whales. Very interesting creature. He got down to the whales. Now, uh, come to Ezekiel chapter 28. I thought I had a definition of, of made and create. Creating, here. I think I remember it. Creating is something like making something from nothing. Making or made is kind of using materials that are there and doing something with that. Something along those lines. So come to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Now like I say, anytime I'm studying stuff like this, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it's like all week my head my head's just been in the clouds. I'm just up there. I'm thinking about heaven. I'm thinking about stars. I'm thinking about God. I'm thinking, and it, I, you know, you say, "Well, this don't, this don't help me out." It's done. Maybe I'm an exception to the rule or whatever. I may be, but this this stuff for some reason helps me out. <laughs> I start thinking about God. I start. Uh, the last thing I'm thinking about is, you know, man, I just can't wait to do some sin or whatever. It actually kind of helps me focus towards God and like, well, I don't know. I mean, worship Him and think, man, this is. It's a, it's a big God that we serve here. Look at, look at, look at Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12. And this is, a, this is an amazing book. All right, Ezekiel 28, 12. Let's try to, let's try to wrap this up here. I'm gonna, I, I was going to break this up into two weeks, but I don't want to spend two weeks on it. Just plow through it. Ezekiel 28, verse number 12. And 38. So now we know God is addressing Satan through the king of Tyrus. That's what the picture is, Okay. Yes, King of Tyrus is a real guy, real historical man, but we're seeing a story painted out through this King of Tyrus, and that's the story of uh, uh, Satan, Lucifer. Look at Ezekiel chapter 28, verse number 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the King of Tyrus. A lamentation, what's that? That's the passionate expression of grief or sorrow, weeping. So what we're about to read here is a lamentation. And I never thought of it this way until I looked up the definition of that word. Something 
that is actually tragically sorrowful is about to follow. And I never thought of it that way. And I'm like, wow, yeah, you know, yeah, there's something. Man, this is this is tragic, man. Take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Say unto thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Starts out good, man. A good, a good looking man, you know, got, you know, got full of wisdom, got, got a whole, you know, a whole life ahead of him, whatever. And we, you know, we all know stories like that and something tragic happens and things. Now, let's see who this, who, who this story is about. Starts off full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Okay, before Adam was. Now look at this. Every precious stone was thy covering. You could read them. Sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. Okay, so you got 10 of them right there. And we know on the Jewish breastplates, there's 12 of them. Okay, the workmanship of thy tablets, of thy pipes, was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So we learned in Jeremiah 4, in the pre-Adamic earth, that there were mountains, hills, birds, fruitful place, cities. Now we see more elements. We see precious metals, gemstones. We see tabrets. We see pipes. That's music. Literally, I guess, inside of this anointed cherub here. Look at verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. So here we find the devil's title, his position, his classification of being. What's his title? Anointed. That's, cr that's crazy, because that's what, that's what the Jesus Christ's title is, the anointed one. Well, the devil once had that title, the anointed. Okay, what's, a cla what's his classification of being? He's a cherub. That that's, would be, I guess, a, uh, with the whole things of faces of a lion, eagle ox, and all that, that would be a cherubim, okay? A cherub. Now, what's his position? He's a coverer. All right, the anointed cherub that covereth. Title, classification, position. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. So no doubt he had the ability to kind of go into God's throne room and worship God. Okay, he, it wasn't when he said, oh, now I'm going to, as soon as he saw sin in here, you ain't coming to my throne room. But, but at one point of time, he was upon the holy mountain of God, heavenly Mount Zion, God's throne, okay? Uh, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Still never could find a su sufficient comment on that verse. I don't know what that means. Um, I don't know what these stones of fire are that he walked, you know, but he could walk right in the, right in the middle of them. And uh, he could go up and down in them. Walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You guys try figuring that one out. I don't know what that is. I don't know if these are some kind of ceremonial coals or stones that have something to do with worshiping God in heaven, or if this is some, you know, I was some planetary travel. I don't know, but he walked, okay? So the devil had legs. That's <laughs> right. So I could get that down at least in the verse. That was walked. Now, verse 15, Thou wast perfect in the ways, uh, in thy ways from the day that thou was created. So what a start. God didn't make the devil. He made the anointed cherub that covereth. All right, that's what he made. Till thou was created. Till, okay, one day, look what happened. Iniquity was found in thee. Not in the throne room, all right, but while he was on earth, Isaiah 14. We covered that. Now look at this. It gets even inter more interesting. Verse 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise. So let's, let's allow the Bible to define for us what this merchandise is. Well, Revelation 18, 12, and I looked up merchandise, and there's all kinds of references, but this sums it up pretty well, actually very well. The merch, Revelation 18, 12, the merchandise of gold, silver, precious stones, and of pearls, and fine linen, and purple, and silk, and scarlet, and thine wood, and all manner of vessels of ivory, and all manners, manners of vessels of most precious wood, and of brass, and iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and odors, and ointments, and frankincense, and wine, and oil, and fine flour, wheat, beasts, sheep, horses, chariots, slaves, and the souls of men. A slave is, is, is merchandise. So, that was until the day, by, by the multitude of thy merchandise, and if we allow that, the Bible to define merchandise for us, 
Lucifer had business affairs going on in when he was around. Not only did he worship God, but that wasn't all that he did. He kind of, to me, it seemed like he had a job, just like we do today. We go to work. Wouldn't it be great if we just spend all day in church and we just worship God all day, you know? We down we go down to these Bible meetings and stuff like that. And we're like, man, we can just live here and just all have a good time. And, you know, no, you got to work. <laughs> Get up and go to work tomorrow. There's jobs. He had merchandise. The same thing in, this, in that world be before. Nothing new under the sun. Now, they have filled. Now, look at this, though. They have filled the midst of thee with violence. Something violent is going on. And thou hast sinned. So, crooked in business. Violent. The guy, the devil became, he somehow became crooked in business. The multitude of merchandise have filled the midst of thee with violence. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. You're not stepping foot in this throne room ever again. I might let you get close to it, like in the book of Job, and the sons of God presenting themselves before the Lord, but we don't know. The Lord could have came down anywhere. The Lord could have met him in the outer space, for all we know. He was like, look, you're not ever coming up in my domain again. I'll meet you somewhere else you want to have a conversation with me. Uh, that's somewhat beyond my mind too. Now, okay. Out of the mountain of God, I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Don't know what that phrase means. Now, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. So this is the first fall of the devil. Okay. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Now I do tend to believe that that's something to do with the tribulation, casting them to the ground, kings behold thee. It's almost like the devil had the had his first fall, and he's going to have a second fall. I mean, it's, it's like the first, first coming of the devil, second coming of the devil, kind of. But they're falls. Um, I look at Ezekiel 28, verse number 18. How about this one? You know, this is, this is interesting too, okay? Thou hast defiled... Thy sanctuaries, they're his sanctuaries, which I believe were kind of once good. They're thy sanctuaries. God's, you know, it's like this. What, what is that? Places of worship. Churches. <laughs> Where? Back in, the, back in the prehistoric earth. And guess what? The same problem that we have today showed up. The, the sanctuaries are being defiled. Why? Because of the, the uh, multitude of thine iniquities. Sin is corrupt in the sanctuary. Same problem that we have today. It's, that's that's kind of crazy. Now, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Okay, the, now it's, the reason why I stress thy sanctuaries is because, you know, they it's like they, they, they were his in a way. You know, I don't know if, if some starting some religion or starting to get some rebellion against God and get people to kind of look at how good and good looking he was. And they became his. They, they not to do with God, you know, worshiping God anymore, possibly. By now, look at this. By the iniquity of thy traffic. Once again, let the Bible define the word traffic for us. Uh, for, write down First Kings chapter ten, verse fourteen and fifteen. You know, and you know what the cross reference is? The weight of gold that came into Solomon in one year was six hundred three score and six talents of gold. Scary. That's a scary cross reference. I'm like, wow, traffic. 666 shows up. And then the verse right after that, beside, he had all the merchantmen and of the traffic of the spice merchants. Spice merchants. So it looks like back in the day they were after some, some spice. Uh, well, I don't know, food thing or whatever. And of all the kings of Arabia and the governors of the country. So that's an interesting cross-reference. Traffic is the going about in business deals. Sending people to do your work and working for you. So look at the rest of this passage here. Therefore, will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. So this is a serious malfunction. There was at a point of time when there was pipes prepared in him. He's a glorious, beautiful instrument, whatever. Now all of a sudden God said, I'm going to bring a fire from the midst of you. There's fire inside of that being. Now, how, well, how did we make sense of that? Job 41. Leviathan, he breathed it out, make the deep to boil like a pot. He's a fire-breathing dragon. That's just that's that's what it is. That's the creature. The anointed. The, the, what we're seeing here is the anointed cherub is now being turned into Leviathan of Job 41. Therefore, I will bring a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee. It consumed his whole character. 
you know, what he once was is not who he is now. Not for a second, okay? And uh, look what he says here. And I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. I'm like, man, this is, this is getting wild. You know, I don't know what exactly is going on here. <laughs> but, you know, here, here's an excerpt from Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> here's, my, here's my commentary and comment on this. this is a, it's a kid, obviously, everybody knows that, but a kid's movie. I always never liked that movie. It's a, it's a woman in love with an animal. And the kids watch it. It's like, you know, it's like it's kind of one Disney movie I never really care for. I don't want to care for a woman watching this, falling in love with a beast and turning into a... But listen, now to a Bible believer, we all know who the beast is. And, you know, the woman is a type of the church and all that. So listen to this excerpt, though. Beauty and the Beast, the character of the beast who is cursed to live as a monstrous creature, is shown to transform into ashes when he is mortally wounded during a climatic battle against Gaston. I had to fact check this with, with, with my wife. Remember, I was sitting on the couch. Like, yes, this happened. Okay, I, I didn't remember that. I never remember that the, the beast. I guess turned into ashes. Now listen, as Belle confesses her love for him, the curse is broken, and the beast is restored to his human form. Just before the last petal of the enchanted rose falls, the transformation scene involves the beast's body disintegrating into glowing ashes, before reforming into human self. Well, Hollywood never has a, a, an original idea. Uh, there, but here's the deal. There's no happily ever after with this beast that we're reading. When God turns him to ashes, there's no, he turns into Prince Charming anymore. <laughs> there's no happily ever after with here. So whatever, whatever man the devil possesses, whether Judas Iscariot comes up or from the bottomless pit, whatever image he portrays to the world to worship him, it's like something mal malfunctions or whatever and his true image is shown. His image shows that's an ugly, shape-shifting reptilian that we're looking at. That's the devil. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what he is, right? We believe that. He's a transformed self an angel of light. But he's a reptile. <laughs> Here's another one. Disney's uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. The evil queen disguises herself as an old peddler woman and offers Snow White a poisoned apple. So this evil queen, she disguises herself. Okay, so the true character isn't known at that point. How about this one? Ursula. That's from The Little Mermaid. Ursula disguises herself as a beautiful human woman named Vanessa to trink, trick Prince Eric into marrying her instead of Ariel. That's what the devil is going to do. Put on a big disguise. I'm Jesus Christ. You know, I'm, the, I'm your savior. Meanwhile, he's an ugly, crooked serpent. <laughs> you know, and he, uh, her true form as a, uh, yeah, Prince Eric marrying instead of Ariel, her true form as an ugly witch appears at the marriage. <laughs> That's, you know, that's interesting. How about this one? Sleeping Beauty. The villain Melissa, Melissa uh meets her end in a dramatic confrontation with Prince Philip. As Maleficent in her, in her dragon form battles Prince Philip at the climax of the film, she is ultimately defeated when he throws his sword, blessed by the good fairies, <laughs> directed into her heart. Maleficent screams in agony, falls from a crumbling cliffside into lands on the ground below, Maleficent is engulfed in a burst of green flame which consumes her and reduces her to ashes, <laughs> signifying her demise. We can go on and on. So the antagonists in the Disney movies, they show the traits of the real antagonist. Who's the real antagonist in this world? The devil. And they got this stuff in the, in, in, in the movies like this, it's written in the stories and stuff. That's my comment on that, on that verse, Disney movies. So... <laughs> Go to, Exodus, go to Ezekiel chapter 28, 19. We're going to try wrapping up here. About that, that ashes verse. I don't know what that is, okay? Well, there's some wild things. We know the devil's going to be chopped up and given to meat to people in the wilderness and stuff too. That's wild. So Ezekiel 20, 19. And they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Some people know the devil. All right? They that know thee among the people shall be astonished. Thou shalt be a terror. <laughs> Thou shalt never, I mean, imagine sitting next to a guy at the Congress table and you look over and he's a reptile. <laughs> you know, they got them conspiracy shape shifting reptilian. I would be terrified if I saw that. I'd say, I'm done with this. I'm coming out. I don't ever want to come back to work ever again if I'm working with, with a bunch of reptiles at the, at the table. But thou shalt be a terror. But I like this. And never shalt thou be anymore. One day he'll wind up in lake of fire, never to be remembered anymore. So let's wrap this up. Genesis, before Genesis 1-1, one, one, the sons of God were created. They saw the earth get created. We didn't even read those verses in Job. 
Lucifer ruled this world for a while as the anointed cherub that covered. He started a rebellion. Uh, in that earth that he once ruled was mountains, hills, birds, a fruitful place, cities, kingdoms, nations, prisoners, precious metal, gemstones, tabrets, pipes, business affairs, merchandise, trafficking, uh, men, not men in the image of God, angelic men. God judged Lucifer. He became that crooked serpent, Leviathan, Satan, the devil. God judged the earth after Satan's rebellion, flooded the entire universe, became Genesis 1-2, and, uh, and you know, then, he, then onward after Genesis 1-2, it explains the world, the 6,000 years creations that we live on today. So we have to rightly divide, and everything fits. That's all, all of that that we talked about in between the lines of two verses in a book. I mean, there's, there's not a book on earth that's like us at all. I mean, the Bible gives us a, a look at a very, very old earth, but very, a very, very new man, a, a new race of men, which is us here today. So I have no argument, actually, with science saying, uh, if I looked up the number now, it's 4.5 billion year old earth, plus or minus a few billion years. They don't know exactly. Evolution's an absolute joke. You're, they're clump us into the thing of, well, gap theory, you know, now you're an evolutionist. No, you can't. You cannot read the, the creation account and get monkey from man. You cannot, you cannot get that. Bible as clear as can be with that, okay? Six literal days to recreate the world. Come to Ecclesiastes 3.15, we'll close up. Okay, Ecclesiastes 3.15. Ecclesiastes 3.15, we all know it, but let's just look at it. Matter of fact, let's just just say this is our verse memorization verse, okay, for, for the night. Exodus 3.15. Oh, I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes 3.15. Now, look what it says. That which hath been is now. Really think of that. That which is that which is to be hath already been. Ain't that something? That which is to be hath already been. God's kingdom, God was once, man, this thing was amazing. Now we got all this and then it's gonna be <laughs> amazing again, you know, in the new heavens and new earth and all that. That which that which hath been is now, but that which is to be hath already been, and God require, requireth that which is past. So you think about this. Are there cities today? Then there's been cities before. Is there merchandise today? In, in this calendar? Yes, then there's been merchandise before on that world. Is there communications today? Well, you know, we've got a phone. We think this is amazing. They had communications back in the, the world that the Lucifer rolled too. This is, this is nothing. <laughs> nothing. Uh, is there means of travel today? We get on a bus. We get on a car. We, we go fly in the sky. That means there's been means of travel back in the day, before Genesis 1-1. So if, you think you're, if, you, if we think we're so advanced today, can you imagine Lucifer's civilization for 4.5 billion years of being around? <laughs> you, you, they, they, ma they would have mastered architecture, engineering, chemistry, warfare, transportation, communication, astronomy, mathematics, intertwining the spiritual and the physical. We're like... We're barely keeping up. It's no wonder why they're like, where are the aliens at? You know, if they would have been... Dude, they'd be so, they're so far ahead. If they, When I say aliens, I'm talking about obviously the, the principalities and powers and stuff. I mean, just look at that. Look at that civilization, okay? And we're like just blobs for brains. And if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word, we'd be done for, completely done for. So, you know, we can say that God... Uh, has, we could say this. Think of this. I want you to think of this thought too. We could say that God has no beginning, no middle, no ending. He was just there. That's the response we give back to people. He was just there. He's, I am that I am. And we, I think about that. Now think of this. How, think of a God with all that wisdom, all that power, all that might, all that knowledge. And he just sat in light for 80 gazillion years. And then just 6,000 years ago, he decided to do something. <laughs> Think of that, 6,000 years. He sat there for trillions of years, and then they say, oh, 6,000 years, we got, we got something now. He finally said, you know what, I'm getting bored up here. Let me do something now. <laughs> After 80 gazillion eons, you know, that's why. That's another reason why I reject the flat earth model. Everything is in like a small snow globe, 
and everything is like right up there. I can kind of just grab a star and like touch it type of thing. I don't, I don't see that in my, in my Bible. I see something massive. I see, um, I see a big world. I see a massive universe because I see, I see a big God. I mean, a big God, you know. And they say science, space is fake, stars in the sky is fake. Every scientist is a liar and all that. No, I don't, I don't see all that. Okay, and it's, I just can't fathom the Lord saying, you know. He looks over to his son. Hey, son, let's let's create something after 80 gazillion years. He probably he created something. I don't know. Maybe 4.5 billion years ago. That's when Satan's kingdom was in all in all his stuff, you know. And Genesis 1:29. That's where we stopped. Um, Genesis 1:29 talks about God create, creating and and, and uh, making man. Talks about the Garden of Eden. Genesis 2. Let me just kind of skim through here. Um, Genesis 3, God didn't just make the man to live down here on the earth, but to keep the garden. And uh, he, he made the earth, he made the garden, he made that for fellowship for, with, you know, with himself. So when those who followed Satan, when they said no to God, God destroyed them. He started over again. And then look what happens. You come to Noah's day. The wickedness was so great in the earth. What were they doing? Buying, selling, marrying, building, planting. But there was no mention of God. In the days of Noah, and that's what was sad about it, and God destroyed all of them. So we got like a three strikes you're out type of deal. It's Genesis one two, He flooded it. Look, I'm gonna do it again in Genesis nine, flood. But He said I'm not gonna do it with water this time. Last time the elements shall melt away with a fervent heat. I'm doing it by fire. And He wraps the whole thing up and He starts over. So in the last days we come back around, and, and the cycle is just about run its course. When we think of this, and you know, it's uh, it's wild stuff here, and, and God's getting, He's getting close to wiping this thing out and starting all over again. But, um, you know, it's uh, pretty wild stuff. Right? I gave you enough stuff to chew on for here. I think you're done. Brains are brains are fried. Enough stuff to chew on for a, a month at least. But I just want you to think what an amazing God He gave us an amazing book. Don't be afraid of what science tells you. Uh, you know, don't discredit everything. And, you know, there, there may be some things that, that they find that, you know, would make sense. Try to find some Bible for it, obviously. And, um, you know, you, you, talk to, you know, you talk to scientists or people that are smart like that, we do have an answer. We, we can reconcile an old earth in that time frame if that's been, you know, with, with Lucifer's planet, with what it, what it once was. You know, you don't just walk up and say, you know what, scientists, the earth's really flat, you know, and yeah, that's going to get you far with these people. You know, I mean, just just think of that stuff. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. All right, dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, I just th- want to thank you so much, Lord, for your word, Lord. I just want to just point all the all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, Lord, that we may worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth, Lord, that we may just, just try to just get a, somewhat of an understanding how great, how powerful, how just mighty and, and just incredible, Lord. You really are, Lord, an amazing God. And I know we, we went over some really deep, deep stuff here tonight, Lord. I pray that we, uh, we think on it, chew on it, read these scriptures again and again. And I, I, I always see something that, some things that I never saw before, Lord, as, as going through this stuff. And this is a kind of a meaty thing, Lord. But um, just I pray that we just think about you, that we know that we serve a, a God that's greater than the devil, Lord. And I'm so thankful, Lord, that you came down on the cross and spoiled the, the mighty man, the strong man. And uh, you came down here and... and, and you kind of you 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 know you took me, Lord. I'm so thankful that uh, you received me, Lord, as your son. And Lord, I know that the devil hates us. He hates everything about us. He'll do everything to destroy us. And I'm thankful, Lord, that you gave us your word. You gave us armor of God to put on, uh, Lord. I, I, I you know uh, just I just want to rejoice that my name is written in the book of life, Lord. That's just that alone. Just that thought alone brings me comfort. Brings me great joy. That one day I could spend eternity with you, Lord, and, and, and see all the, the amazing, glorious things that you have in store for the future, Lord. We get bogged down with the, you know, the Antichrist and the tribulation coming up. But, Lord, we got so much time and so many blessings to look forward to, Lord, in the millennium and the new earth. And just uh, help us seek those things which are above, Lord. And just this, this life is just but a, but a little blip in time. Help us do what we can for you. Uh, while, while we still got time, help us serve you better. Get the word out, get the gospel out. Stay close to you in fellowship, Lord. And we just love you. We'll give you all the preeminence tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. All righty, Ecclesiastes 3, which one was it? Ecclesiastes 3, 15.
315. Ecclesiastes 315. All right.